Good evening, it's Friday, April 8th. Ukrainian authorities say a missile hits a train station in eastern Ukraine where thousands had gathered, killing at least 52 and wounding dozens more in an attack on a crowd of mostly women and children trying to flee a new looming Russian offensive. The attack that some denounce as yet another war crime in the six-week-old conflict comes as workers unearth bodies from a mass grave in Busha, a town near Ukraine's capital, where dozens of killings have been documented after a Russian pullout. A senior U.S. defense official says the Pentagon has determined that some of the Russian combat units that retreated from the Kiev area in recent days are so heavily damaged and depleted that their combat utility is in question. The official describes the units as, for all intents and purposes, eradicated. Tearfully embracing a history-making moment, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson says today her confirmation as the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court shows the progress of America. At a ceremony on the sunny White House South Lawn, she quotes poet Maya Angelou. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. So as I take on this new role, I strongly believe that this is a moment in which all Americans can take great pride. Wisconsin's Democratic Governor Tony Evers today vetoes a package of bills passed by the Republican-controlled legislature that would have made a series of changes to the battleground state's election laws, part of a nationwide Republican effort to reshape elections following President Biden's victory over Donald Trump. Jurors acquit two defendants of all charges in a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, but can't agree on a verdict for two others. Defense attorneys portrayed their clients as weekend warriors often stoned, prone to wild talk, and tricked by FBI undercover agents and informants. And the National Weather Service is warning of weekend fire danger from Sacramento to Redding, driven by strong winds, low humidity, and dry fuels. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KBFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Authorities said today a missile hit a train station in eastern Ukraine where thousands had gathered, killing at least 52, wounding dozens more in an attack on a crowd of mostly women and children trying to flee a new looming Russian offensive in the east. Photos from the station in Kramatorsk showed the dead covered with tarps and the remnants of a rocket with the words, For the Children, painted on it in Russian. The Office of Ukraine's Prosecutor General said about 4,000 civilians had been in and around the station, heeding calls to leave before fighting intensifies in the Donbass region. The attack that some denounced as yet another war crime in the six-week-old conflict came as workers unearthed bodies from a mass grave in Bucha, a town near Ukraine's capital, where dozens of killings have been documented after a Russian pullout. Russia has accused Ukraine of staging civilian deaths in Busha and today denied any responsibility for the missile strike on the train station. U.S. military analysts said the projectile was a short-range missile fired from Russian or separatist-held territory in eastern Ukraine and packed with cluster-like bomblets. 
President Biden's chief spokesperson today called the Russian missile attack on a train station in eastern Ukraine another horrific atrocity by Russian forces, but stopped short of calling the action a war crime. Press Secretary Jen Psaki at the White House. Well, what we've seen over the course of the last six weeks or uh, more than that um, has been um, what the president himself has characterized as uh, war crimes, which is the intentional targeting uh, of civilians. This is yet another horrific atrocity committed by Russia, striking civilians who are trying to evacuate and reach safety. Where we are now is we're going to support efforts to investigate the, this attack as we document Russia's actions, hold them accountable, and we will continue to surge security assistance and weapons deliveries to help Ukraine defend their country. Obviously, the targeting of civilians would certainly be a war crime, and we've already called a range of the actions we've seen to date a war crime, but we're going to be supporting efforts to investigate exactly what happened here. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, the board chair of Russian metals company Rusal, has called for an investigation into events in the Kiev suburb of Busha, where Ukrainian officials say Russian troops killed civilians. Rusal chair Bernard Zonaveld didn't address who was responsible or even directly say anyone was killed in Busha, where Ukrainian forces and journalists discovered scores of bodies on streets and in mass graves after Russian troops withdrew. Zonneveld said the reports from Busha shocked us and that we support an objective and impartial investigation of this crime. The statement stood out because Russian companies have generally remained silent about the war in Ukraine amid the suppression of opposition by Russian authorities and state-controlled media narratives. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson pledged another $130 million in high-grade military equipment to Ukraine today, saying Britain wants to help Ukraine defend itself. Speaking at a news conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Johnson said he would give Ukraine's military more Starstreak anti-aircraft missiles, another 800 anti-tank missiles, and precision munitions capable of lingering in the skies until directed to their targets. He also promised more helmets, night vision, and body armor. The items, in addition to some 200,000 pieces of non-lethal military equipment from the UK that had already been promised. The pledge of new weaponry came as Johnson condemned the attack on the train station in the eastern part of Ukraine. Simon Marks reports. Britain's Defence Secretary is Ben Wallace. The striking of civilian critical infrastructure is a war crime. What Putin is doing today is building his own cage around himself. Sanctions must not be freely lifted to allow him to go back to his super yachts and normality. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held talks today with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. She visited Bucha, the scene of Russian atrocities against civilians last month. The Ukrainians told her they want tougher sanctions against Russia and more weapons. Covering the talks, correspondent Bell True of Britain's independent newspaper. Zelensky is urging the EU um, and Europe as a whole to do more. He specifically wants the banning of purchases of oil and gas from Russia, as he says, that's basically feeding their coffers. I mean, basically, Europe relies massively heavily on oil and gas from Russia. Slovakia today said it's sending an S-300 air defence system to Ukraine. The US says it will in turn provide Slovakia with Patriot anti-aircraft missiles. Simon Marks reporting. A senior US defence official says the Pentagon has determined that some of the Russian combat units that retreated from the Kiev area in recent days are so heavily damaged and depleted that their combat utilities in question. The official described the units as for all intents and purposes eradicated, with only a small number of functioning troops and weapons remaining. The official spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss internal U.S. military assessments and did not say how many units sustained such extensive damage. The official said some combat units that withdrew from the Kiev area are beginning to move toward the Russian towns of Belgorod and Valyuki for refitting and resupplying before likely redeploying to the Donbass area of Ukraine.
The official also said the U.S. has seen thousands of additional Russian troops added to the combat force that Moscow has been using in and around the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. The official said that the U.S. believes Russia has lost 15 to 20 percent of the combat power it had assembled along Ukraine's borders before launching its its invasion on February 24th. Ukrainian officials say Russian forces have almost completely withdrawn from northern Ukraine and are turning their attention to the east. The officials also say they expect to find more evidence of atrocities in the areas abandoned by Russian forces. Ali Barrett reports. Volodymyr Zelensky claims the situation in Borodyanka is much worse than in nearby Bucha. Hundreds of civilians were found dead there when Russian forces withdrew. David Miliband, the head of the International Rescue Committee, says the conflict is shifting. The Russian retreat means that there are more parts of the country where it's safer and where access can take place. But there are these battle zones in the south and the east which remain very dangerous. And in the case of Mariupol, absolutely strangled. UK intelligence says it believes that Russian forces have now fully withdrawn from northern Ukraine to Belarus and Russia. Some of those forces, the UK's Ministry of Defence believes, will transfer to eastern Ukraine to fight in the Donbass region. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Oli Barrett. Russia's central bank says it's lowering a key interest rate and said more cuts could be on the way. The decision indicates the bank thinks strict capital controls and other civilian measures are stabilizing Russia's currency and financial system, despite intense pressure from Western sanctions over the war in Ukraine. The bank said today it lowered its benchmark rate from 20 to 17 percent effective Monday. It had raised the rate from 9.5% on February 28th, that's four days after the invasion, as a way to support the ruble's plunging exchange rate. A currency collapse would worsen already high inflation for Russian shoppers by ballooning the cost of imported goods. The rate increase shows how the central bank has managed to stabilize key aspects of the economy with severe controls, artificially propping up the ruble to allow it to respond to levels seen before the invasion of Ukraine, even as the West piles on more sanctions. But a slightly different story at the White House, as President Biden's press secretary Jen Psaki today argued that Western sanctions are achieving their objectives and hitting home. Uh, it has. We have a couple of objectives um, at this point as it relates to the war in Ukraine. One is to uh, impose uh, severe consequences, uh, send a marker uh, for the world and for history uh, about the uh, the horrific nature of these atrocities. Um, these consequences, and the second part of our objective is to ensure that these consequences are having a significant impact on the economy in Russia. We're seeing an inflationary rate of about 15 percent, a projection of a uh, contraction of 15% in the Russian economy. 600 private sector companies have left Russia. We know it is having the impact that the world intended. This is the most significant coordinated set of sanctions ever done in history on this large of an economy. The third objective here is to make it much more difficult for President Putin to fund his war. And if you look back, say, earlier this week at the example of uh, the bond payments and how uh, Russia has basically been put in a decision of uh, in a place where they uh, either have to use their limited resources they have that are also being used to fund the war uh, to prevent a default or default. Um, that is the position they are in at this point in time, but also because we have cut them off through export controls and a number of other means from having access to materials and technology, but also access to funds, it makes it more difficult for them to fund the war. That is part of it. And the last objective uh, is to continue to make it clear that this is a, uh, a strategic blunder, their their decision to invade Ukraine, um, and, um, and one that will make President Putin a pariah in the world. So those are why and what we are hoping to achieve. President Biden's press secretary, Jen Psaki. The United States has sharply increased the number of Ukrainians admitted to the country at the Mexican border. 
as even more refugees fleeing the Russian invasion follow the same circuitous route. A government recreation center in the Mexican border city of Tijuana has grown to about a thousand waiting refugees. But Tijuana officials and volunteers say the U.S. has recently begun processing them much faster. The Biden administration has said it would take up to 100,000 Ukrainians, but Mexico is the only route producing significant numbers thus far. Appointments at U.S. consulates in Europe are scarce, and refugee resettlement takes time. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. <laughs> President Joe Biden today celebrated the confirmation of Judge <coughs> Katanji Brown Jackson as the first black woman to be confirmed to the United States Supreme Court with a ceremony on the South Lawn at the White House. Biden hailed the occasion as a moment of real change in American history. Jackson, who was confirmed by the Senate yesterday, will take the bench later this year, filling the shoes of retiring Justice Stephen Breyer on a court that was made up entirely of white men <coughs> for almost two centuries. Jackson, at times speaking through her tears as she thanked her family and mentors for their support, noted the historical significance of her nomination with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris by her side today. I strongly believe that this is a moment in which all Americans can take great pride. We have come a long way toward perfecting our union. In my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. President Biden nominated her on the second anniversary of his pledge ahead of the South Carolina Democratic presidential primary to select a black woman for the court. That move, that promise, helped resurrect his failing campaign at the time. Biden said the prospect of putting someone like Jackson on the court helped motivate his bid for the presidency. Judge Jackson will join the United States Supreme Court, and like every justice, the decisions she makes will impact on the lives of America for a lot longer in many cases than any laws we all make. But the truth is, she's already impacting the lives of so many Americans. Jackson will be the high court's first former public defender. With the elite legal background of other justices as well, she has degrees from Harvard and Harvard Law School and held top clerkships, including one for Justice Breyer himself. Jackson's arrival on the bench won't upend the current 6-3 to three conservative balance, but in addition to the racial history, it will put, for the first time, four women on the court at once. Vice President Kamala Harris, the first black woman to attain her office. President George Washington once referred to America as a great experiment, a nation founded on the previously untested belief that the people, we the people, could form a more perfect union. And that belief has pushed our nation forward for generations. And it is that belief that we reaffirmed yesterday. Katanji Brown Jackson won't take office immediately. Justice Breyer is to step down after the court concludes its current term, which is usually in late June or early July. Only then will she take the oath to become an associate justice. Exxon Mobil Corporation announced this week that its first quarter results could top a seven-year quarterly record with operating profits from pumping oil and gas alone of up to $9.3 billion. A snapshot of the largest U.S. oil company's quarter ended March 31st, showing operating profits from oil and gas. Its biggest unit could jump by as much as 40% over the prior quarter. Also this week, a House of Representatives committee held a hearing on price gouging at the gas pump. Mary Sherman filed this report. 
And there's nothing wrong with making an honest profit, but as gas prices have soared, your companies have funneled record profits back to shareholders. Oil executives were in the hot seat as a House subcommittee accused companies of price gouging. Committee Chair Congressman Frank Poloni questioned why pump prices remain high while crude oil prices have been dropping for weeks. ExxonMobil Chairman and CEO Darren Wood countered, no single company sets prices. The market establishes the price based on available supply and the demand for that supply. Continued investments in new production is the only way to achieve balanced markets and more affordable prices that bring real relief at the pump. While most of the hearing acknowledged the Russian-Ukraine conflict's effect on fuel prices, Democrats scolded executives for sitting on thousands of leases to drill on public lands, artificially squeezing supply. Congressman Morgan Griffith, the highest-ranking Republican on the panel, blamed the White House. When President Biden points to Vladimir Putin or big oil or other scapegoats as the culprit, I'm reminded of the words of the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to that man standing behind the curtain. The six companies at the hearing recorded $77 billion in profits in 2021. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The U.S. Energy Secretary is calling on oil and gas producers to increase their output to help stabilize the gasoline market and to minimize harm to American families. This will kick Texas into high gear as the nation's largest fossil fuel producing state. Epiphany Lachey reports. It also puts the state in a vulnerable position, says Professor Faisal Khan, a Texas A&M University expert on energy safety and security. As a major hub for energy production, Khan says the state is a target for Russian cyber attacks as the war in Ukraine continues. Since then, there have been instances where both cyclical and cyber attacks had happened in the energy infrastructure. What had happened and what's happening in Europe, Texas remained to be a vulnerable point from a safety and security perspective. Khan says some attempted attacks have been resolved, but it's a warning that bad actors are out there and looking for ways to damage infrastructure. He notes it's important to remain vigilant and not panic. Khan doesn't believe the state's power plants and power grids are where they should be in terms of preventing cyber attacks, but he says they're better than they were two years ago. And he thinks greater investment is needed to remain one step ahead of the hackers. And that can only be possible if we continue to invest in research and making sure that this research remains applied and practical to our, our, to our energy infrastructure. CEOs of major oil companies were grilled this week in Congress in a House hearing on gas prices and record corporate profits. They were accused of putting shareholders above consumers, but the executive says they don't control the global market price. And according to Khan, the possibility of surging gas supply, some of which will end up in European markets, could cause another rise in prices. While this might be seen a easing a pressure at a global level, but if it didn't do that, what it's meant to be, it will have a significant negative impact on local oil prices or gas prices. I'm Epiphany Lachey, Texas News Service. At least two dozen states are seeing the bird flu virus quickly spread through commercial flocks on poultry-producing farms, feeding concerns about even higher meat prices amid an ongoing wave of inflation. Reporter Mike Bowen has that story. I was at the center of it all with renewed focus on potential stress for smaller producers and the role of factory farms. State and federal officials say nearly a dozen Iowa counties have seen outbreaks on farms. Solis Christie is with the group Practical Farmers of Iowa, which educates producers on making their land more resilient. She says while an outbreak within a smaller flock might not have the same ripple effect as a larger farm, it still poses challenges. They have a bird that tests positive and then they have to call all of their flock. That turnaround is just much more of a detriment because... They're starting all over again, as opposed to having, you know, maybe I'm a larger producer and I have four or five barns. Ag experts say the virus has led to higher prices for products such as eggs. Christy notes that for smaller producers, there's potential impact on what they sell at places such as farmers markets. Nationally, other groups cite the impact of corporate farms and the need to limit concentrated animal feeding operations. But industry leaders insist those large facilities are well shielded from wild birds carrying the virus. DNR officials in affected states say the spread is linked to wild birds, such as ducks and geese. But Patty Lavero with the Campaign for Family Farms and the Environment 
says the nation has become too reliant on factory farms and that all it takes is for a virus to slip through and wreak havoc. We are putting so many animals often that are genetically identical, together in one place, the disease just runs through very quickly and does a tremendous amount of damage. In Iowa, Christie says while producers with smaller flocks might be more susceptible to an outbreak, they are taking the threat seriously. Our farmers are just as vigilant as a lot of the large producers, and even more so because many of our farmers have their animals either you know out on pasture or grazing but that's not to say that our farmers aren't taking their own precautions mike moen iowa news service a jury today acquitted two men of all charges in a plot to kidnap michigan governor gretchen whitmer but could not reach verdicts against the two alleged leaders a stunning defeat for the government after a weeks-long trial that centered on a remarkable FBI sting operation just before the 2020 election. Governor Whitmer did not immediately comment on the outcome, although her chief of staff was critical, saying Americans are living through the normalization of political violence. The result was announced on the fifth day of deliberations, a few hours after the jury said it had been struggling to find unanimity on charges in the 10-count indictment. The judge told the panel to keep working, but jurors emerged again after lunch to say they still were deadlocked on some counts. Daniel Harris, 24, and Brandon Caserta, 33, were found not guilty of conspiracy. In addition, Harris was acquitted of charges related to explosives and a gun. They are now clear and free. The jury could not reach verdicts for Adam Fox, 38, Barry Croft, Jr., 46, which means the government can put them on trial again for two conspiracy charges. Croft also faces a separate explosive charge. They'll remain in custody. During 13 days of testimony in Grand Rapids courtroom, prosecutors offered evidence from undercover agents, a crucial informant, and two men who pled guilty to the plot. Jurors also read and heard secretly recorded conversations, violent social media posts, and chat messages. Ty Garbin, who pled guilty and is serving a six-year prison sentence, said the plan was to get Governor Whitmer and cause enough chaos to trigger a civil war before the election, keeping Joe Biden from winning the presidency. Garbin and Caleb Franks, who also pled guilty and testified for the government, were among the six who were arrested in October 2020 amid talk according to trial testimony, of raising $4,000 for an explosive to blow up a bridge and stymie any police response to the kidnapping. Prosecutors said the group was steeped in anti-government extremism and furious over Governor Whitmer's pandemic restrictions. There was evidence of a crudely built shoot house to practice going in and out of Whitmer's vacation home and a night ride by Croft, Fox, and covert operatives to check the property. But defense lawyers portrayed the men as credulous weekend warriors often stoned on marijuana and prone to big, wild talk. They said FBI agents and informants tricked and cajoled the men into targeting the governor. A North Carolina man has become the second member of the Proud Boys to plead guilty to conspiring with other members of the extremist group to stop Congress from certifying the Electoral College vote. Charles Donahoe pled guilty today to charges of conspiracy and assaulting federal officers during an appearance in federal court in Washington. The indictment against Donahoe and other members of extremist groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers have been a focus of the Justice Department's investigation of the January 6, 2021 insurrection. Meanwhile, a federal jury has begun deliberating in the case against a former Virginia police officer charged with storming the U.S. Capitol. Jurors today heard closing arguments in the trial of former Rocky Mount police officer Thomas Robertson. Wisconsin's Democratic Governor Tony Evers is up for re-election in November. Today vetoed a package of bills passed by the Republican-controlled legislature that would have made a series of changes to the battleground state's election laws. 
Republicans who fast-tracked the bills don't have the votes to override his vetoes. The bills are part of a nationwide Republican effort to reshape elections following President Biden's victory over Donald Trump. The bills were quickly passed earlier this year amid Trump's insistence that the 2020 election was stolen from him and that there was widespread fraud despite no evidence to back up his claims. Courts, recounts, independent audits, bipartisan and partisan reviews have all upheld President Biden's nearly 21,000 vote victory in Wisconsin. Evers said the vetoed bills were passed under the guise of needing to reform the state's election system because elected officials enabled disinformation about Wisconsin's elections and elections process. After a court order, Wisconsin State Assembly Speaker Robin Voss has handed over more than 10,000 emails related to the partisan review of the state's 2020 elections to an independent watchdog group called American Oversight. Jonah Chester reports. The probe, commissioned by Voss and led by former state Supreme Court Justice Michael Gableman, has a taxpayer-funded budget of $676,000. In a court hearing Thursday, Voss's attorney Ronald Stadler said not all of the documents are actually related to the investigation, as attorneys used keyword searches to sort the messages. There is somewhere between 10 and 20,000 emails that have been produced. There's a lot of duplicates, but it was done pursuant to agreed upon search terms between the parties. So if it hit on it, it's been produced, and that's why there is the, the volume that there is. Last month, Gableman released an interim report on the investigation, which contained essentially no new findings about the 2020 spring and fall elections. The report and Gableman's accompanying call to decertify the November election, which is impossible, drew bipartisan criticism. The documents released this week haven't yet been made public, but likely will be soon. American Oversight, which has filed other open records lawsuits concerning the probe, was still seeking additional messages on Voss's phone, which his attorneys say have been deleted. A digital forensics expert hired by Voss's attorney told the court Thursday that obtaining those deleted texts and emails would be difficult, if not impossible. Based on that testimony, Judge Valerie Bailey Wren barred further searches of Voss's or his associates' phones. She also raised concerns over Voss's personal privacy. And I don't see how you can separate his private messages from his public messages if, in fact, you could even recover deleted messages, which I think is doubtful. The document dump comes the week after Bailey Wren held Voss and the Republican-controlled State Assembly in contempt of court in a separate open records case brought by American Oversight. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reports Voss and the Assembly have about a week to turn over records requested in that suit before both begin incurring fines of $1,000 per day. For the Wisconsin News Connection, I'm Jonah Chester. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. This is the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at this hour with a half-hour edition on the weekends. Our newscasts, all of them, are archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Merkel. California colleges, especially two-year institutions, are working overtime to try to attract more students this fall in the wake of a big drop in enrollment during the coronavirus pandemic. Suzanne Potter has that story. According to the National Student Clearinghouse, California colleges lost more than 250,000 students from 2019 to 2021. U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona says enrollment plummeted by one million students nationwide. With the steepest declines at our community colleges and among men of color, the impact of this missing million could be felt for decades. A Gallup poll found that the adult students who had the hardest time staying enrolled are those who act as caregivers, are multiracial, or come from households that make less than $24,000 a year. Congress raised Pell Grants by $400 a year in the March federal spending bill, but advocates say those grants would need to be doubled in order to make a meaningful difference in college affordability. Dr. Raul Rodriguez is chancellor of the San Jose Evergreen Community College District. He says schools are partnering with employers to create programs that will lead directly to good jobs, and they're making college more accessible. One of the things that we committed to early on was reaching out to the students we lost, calling them and find out what's going on, how can we help you. As well, this year we haven't charged students for tuition. 
And we're continuing that through next fall. Many schools are trying to make courses more attractive to working adults by offering more online courses, even making lectures viewable after the fact, a trend called asynchronous scheduling. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. State lawmakers introduced legislation to reform the way the criminal justice system treats women. The authors of the Women in Criminal Justice Reform Act say it takes steps to advance rehabilitation and improve public safety by addressing the ways that women are differently and disproportionately impacted within the criminal justice system. KPFA's Christina Anastad reports. A group of bipartisan women lawmakers are bringing attention to ways in which women are treated by the criminal justice system and calling for reform. Los Angeles Representative Democrat Karen Bass is sponsor of the Women in Criminal Justice Reform Act. She says incarceration is an intergenerational problem, particularly when a mother is imprisoned. One of the things that we know is that when mothers are incarcerated, their children are at terrible risk. Terrible risk for who is going to take care of them. Many of these children wind up in the foster care system. And a very sad statistic is that 50% of children who have a parent who is incarcerated, and especially a mother who is incarcerated, wind up incarcerated themselves. The Women in Criminal Justice Reform Act would require federal law enforcement officers to make proper arrangements for children when a parent or guardian is arrested, like contacting a relative rather than placing them in the foster care system. It would also require judicial officers to consider the impacts on minors or dependent children when determining bail amounts of a parent accused of a crime. According to the Sentencing Project, the rates of incarcerated women has increased 700 percent over the last four decades. Representative Democrat Jackie Speer of San Francisco and San Mateo is an author of the legislation. She's visited the women's federal prison in Dublin, California, and says some 40 percent of the incarcerated women there were doing prison time for nonviolent drug trafficking known as mules. They can be rehabilitated, they can be reconnected with their children, they can go on house arrest, they can have ankle bracelets. There's so many other ways of bringing these uh, women who have committed crimes, but these are um, crimes that I think they have been persuaded to uh, or forced to engage in. And um, it could also save the taxpayers about $39,000 a year. According to its authors, the Women in Criminal Justice Reform Act would pursue gender-informed alternatives to incarceration and encourage diversion or rehabilitation programs. It would also end the policies that overly punish women through what's known as the girlfriend problem, which levy harsher charges on partners of drug traffickers, often a wife or a girlfriend, through an added conspiracy charge which impose stiffer penalties than what an actual trafficker receives. The bipartisan bill is also authored by Congresswoman Nancy Mace, a South Carolina Republican, whereas a state representative, she pushed for criminal justice reforms for women. When we do intervene, either pre-trial or when they get out and providing resources, a job, job training skills, counseling and therapy, the rate of recidivism is uh, so much lower for, for these women that they do not return uh, in, in very high degrees, especially when you have incentives and provide for them both from a healthcare and nutritional perspective, but allow them to see their kids, having that incentive to be able to continue that relationship as they recover and as they get the resources that they need is so so important as a mother in inspiring them to improve that situation, come back and come out of it stronger than ever before and not go back. The bill would also amend the Adoption and Safe Families Act so incarcerated parents don't lose custody of their children. The Adoption and Safe Families Act states if a parent cannot reunite with their children within a certain number of months, the child will be automatically put up for adoption. The supporters say helps prevent the trauma of family separation. The Women in Criminal Justice Reform Act is pending in the House.
I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. Authorities will not bring criminal charges against officers who pinned an Oakland man to the ground during an arrest a year ago that ended in his death. The Alameda County District Attorney's Office released a custody death report that found the officers acted reasonably in stopping and restraining 26-year-old Mario Gonzalez in April of 2021. A coroner's report said Gonzalez died from the toxic effects of methamphetamine use, but the stress of being restrained was a contributing factor. His mother and son have filed federal civil rights lawsuits that contend the officers asphyxiated him. The family of Luis Gangora Pat rallied in San Francisco this week demanding an investigation and charges be filed against the shooting officer Gangora Pat's brother Jose Gangora Pat It's been six years today that we haven't found justice for Luis Demetrio Gangora who was assassinated by the police The shooting officer, Michael Malone, left the San Francisco Police Department before facing disciplinary actions for the fatal shooting of Gongora Pat. He left to work at the Antioch Police Department, which has been under scrutiny for its officers' use of force in deadly incidents. Organizers are calling on San Francisco District Attorney Tessa Boudin to investigate and file charges against the former officer. Gongora Pat, a native of a small Yucatan village in Mexico, worked as a prep cook at restaurants after arriving in the early 2000s. But in April of 2016, he lived in a tent in the mission. He was known in the neighborhood for playfully kicking around a soccer ball before police shot and killed him. In a 2019 report made public by the police commission, police leadership found that Officer Malone acted out of policy by firing a beanbag shotgun at Gugora Pot seconds before he and another officer, Sergeant Nate Steger, shot and killed Gugora Pat on Shotwell Street between 18th and 19th. The shooting took place 30 seconds after the officers engaged with Gongora Pat. A lawsuit against the police in the case was settled out of court for $140,000. This week, members of Faith in Texas were to be at the county jail in Dallas as they are on most Fridays. Epiphany Lachey reports. As the state's incarceration rate grows, the group is making its case for cash bail reform by freeing people from jail who are unable to post their own bill. The group says the bail system discriminates against low-income people. Rosares White, who went to jail for property theft, says he didn't know how long he would be incarcerated or even if he would receive bail. White says he is grateful for the assistance. Because it shows that somebody care about you and it make you want to care about yourself. Since his release, he asked the organization has helped him find a job and get back to his everyday life. People who qualify to have their bail paid must not have any legal holds or aggravated charges. Some 55,000 individuals are in Texas jails. Faith in Texas says it budgets $10,000 to $15,000 a month for this project and has paid the bill for 31 people since July of last year. Mark Walters Jr., the group's bail fund organizer, says the turnover rate has been small. So far, only one person has missed a court date and one more is back in jail. Walters says people are sometimes referred by the public defender's office or family members. A means to an end. Our ultimate goal is for bail to not even be an issue in some degree. You know, we've bailed out individuals who who've been in 30, 60, 90 days on a one dollar bond. He points out that it costs the county a lot more to incarcerate someone than to release them on bond. According to the website prisonpolicy.org, more than 700,000 people are locked up in Texas. The highest percentage are black, followed by Hispanic. Walter says the group plans to continue its fight against bail policies it sees as discriminatory by expanding services to other Texas counties with the help of partners on a larger scale. No one entity can do it all, so how are we put in individual organizational self-interest kind of on the back burner and and really leaning into, you know, those collaborative partnerships. I'm Epiphany Lachey, Texas News Service. 
The man who started a 2020 wildfire that killed 12 endangered California condors and seriously injured a firefighter has been convicted of arson. Ivan Gomez was convicted in Monterey County of 16 felony counts, including arson and animal cruelty. He could face up to 24 years in prison. Prosecutors say Gomez told them he set the August 2020 Big Sur Dolan fire while illegally growing marijuana in the Los Padres National Forest. The blaze northwest of Los Angeles injured several firefighters when seriously destroyed 10 homes, burned down a condor sanctuary. The price is going up for destruction. Disrupting airline flights. The Federal Aviation Administration said today that it's seeking record civil fines against two passengers who assaulted other people on flights last summer. In one case, a woman tried to open a cabin door, then headbutted and spit at crew members and passengers after she was placed in flexible handcuffs. The FAA is seeking an $81,950 fine. The second case, the FAA is proposing a $77,272 fine against a woman who tried to open a cabin door during a flight and bit another passenger repeatedly before she was restrained by crew members. And federal prosecutors say a Los Angeles man has pled guilty to interfering with a flight attendant, causing a California-based flight to be diverted to Oklahoma City. 35-year-old Ariel James Pennington pled guilty on Wednesday. He faces up to 20 years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine when he's formally sentenced later this year. You're listening to the Evening News in KBFA Berkeley, KBFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. Israeli security forces say they have killed a Palestinian man who opened fire into a crowded bar in central Tel Aviv and killed two people. They say the attacker was tracked down after an overnight manhunt and killed in an exchange of fire. It was the fourth deadly attack in Israel by Palestinians in less than three weeks. Tens of thousands of people attended weekly prayers today in Jerusalem with no immediate reports of unrest. Pacifica's Rami amul Magari has more in this report from Gaza. Crowds of Palestinians from the West Bank city of Jenin gathered last night around the home of Rad Hazim, the Palestinian 28-year-old guy who carried out a shootout in the heart of Tel Aviv city on Thursday evening. Speaking to the crowds, the father of Rad expressed defiance in the wake of the death of his son at the hands of Israeli security forces following the shootout in Tel Aviv. <laughs> We are not backing down or betraying our religion and homeland. I would say, may God bless you, and may God shower you and the mothers of martyrs with great patience. God is the only Almighty. The latest shootout in Tel Aviv comes on top of a series of such Palestinian actions over the past few weeks in which more than 10 Israelis have been killed and many others wounded. The Israeli military is now considering expanding security operations across the West Bank, particularly in Jenin City, home to two Palestinians who have reportedly carried out the attacks. The tense situation could lead to higher tension in the region during the holy month of Ramadan. Since the beginning of April, armed Palestinian factions, including Hamas in Gaza and the Islamic Jihadi group, have vehemently rejected what they termed attacks by hardline Israeli Jews into the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in East Jerusalem, the latest of which 
was a visit by the far-right Israeli member of parliament, Etomar Gver, along with hundreds of other hardline Israelis. Yet veteran Gaza-based political analyst Talal Okel believes that Israel will not launch a major military attack on Jenin City the way Israel did back in 2002 when at least 50 Palestinians were killed. <laughs> Israel seems to not want to allow things to go out of control, especially the international community is now strongly condemning what it describes as war crimes committed by Russia against Ukraine. So, in case Israel goes for a large-scale attack, it will face an unprecedented criticism by the international community that now defends human rights. Unexpectedly, some regional powers, including Turkey and Bahrain, had condemned the latest Tel Aviv shootout. United States showed full solidarity with Israel as the latter faces a unique wave of Palestinian reaction to provocations by hardline Jews to the feelings of Muslim Palestinians during Ramadan. The Western-backed Palestinian Authority in Ramallah has not condoned the shootings of Israelis, but in the meantime, it warned Israel against responding militarily against the Palestinian people in both West Bank and Gaza Strip. Hamas has not publicly endorsed the attacks either. Veteran analyst Okel expects that Israel would likely go for pinpoint attacks on Palestinians and the West Bank, including extrajudicial killing of Palestinian resistance operatives. He also believes that Arab populations inside Israel will face more racist Israeli restrictions from now on. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami al Mirari in Gaza. President Emmanuel Macron said today he has no fear of losing France's presidential election, despite despite far-right rival Marine Le Pen narrowing the gap in opinion polls days before the first round vote. Still suspense is the watchword in Sunday's voting to choose the top two among a dozen contenders with a predicted low turnout that could help decide the race. Le Pen, running in her third presidential race, has consistently placed second behind Macron in the polls. She appeared to close the gap even further. According to the latest polls, which have given a difference of between one and six points between the two. If the polls mirror election results, Macron and Le Pen would repeat the 2017 scenario, squaring off in a second round runoff on April 24th. Macron won then by a landslide five years ago, taking 66% of the vote to Le Pen's 34%. This time, though, the polls are forecasting the score to be much closer. Le Pen has expended much energy to take the edge off her national rally party in order to make it more appealing to the voters. She softened her image even more and made purchasing power the centerpiece of her campaign, but has not given up on her key themes— stopping the migratory submersion and eradicating political Islam. Macron spoke to several French television and radio channels and newspapers this week. In a final push to promote his policies, he cited his presidential duties, notably his diplomatic efforts over the war in Ukraine, to justify his absence during much of the campaign, which has been criticized by the other candidates. Turnout could be the deciding factor in the election and could harm Le Pen's chances most because of her working-class support base is composed of voters who tend to stay at home on Election Day. Reporter Simon Marks has more. It's a big weekend in France, the first round of presidential elections that see Emmanuel Macron facing a much tougher battle than expected to secure a second term in office. Far-right populist Marine Le Pen is hoping that she could eke out a come-from-behind victory in a race that has seen her closing the gap with Macron. The other candidate in the race, veteran left-winger Jean-Luc Mélenchon, is a distant third. Lisa Louis is a reporter in Paris and says the war in Ukraine 
Ukraine and some fresh domestic initiatives unveiled by Macron have done nothing to help him on the campaign trail. Well, absolutely. In the beginning, this was a clear race. And so people didn't get that interested. And then his uh, ratings have gone down again. And it seems more and more of a close race, especially as he finally entered uh, the race. He became a candidate and then announced some measures that are highly unpopular, like, for example, pushing up the retirement age from 62 uh, to 65. That's a bit like blasphemy here in France. Many people feel uh, that they can't really vote for him anymore. And that's why also, you know, those that feel that they now should rather vote for Marine Le Pen or even the far left candidate, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, that share of the voters have re- has really gone up. The second round, a runoff between the two top candidates this Sunday, will take place in two Sundays' time. Simon Marks reporting. Navajo Nation health officials have further loosened COVID-19 restrictions as new infections continue to decline. More people will be allowed into businesses and to gather socially. Arizona Public Radio's Ryan Heinches reports. The Navajo Department of Health issued three emergency orders Tuesday that transitioned the tribe from orange status to the less restrictive yellow status. Under the relaxed rules, businesses like restaurants, hotels, and the tribe's four casinos can now operate at 75% capacity. In addition, up to 25 people are now allowed to gather for social functions, traditional ceremonies, and church services, and capacity limits for school sporting events have also been increased. The orders keep in place a reservation-wide mask mandate that applies to schools and all other public spaces for both tribal members and visitors. The Navajo Nation was hit particularly hard by the pandemic and at one point in 2020 had the highest per capita infection rate in the U.S. As a result, tribal officials have kept several mandates in place long after surrounding states like Arizona and Utah rescinded their own. The Navajo Nation experienced all-time high levels of COVID cases in mid-January, but in recent weeks, new infections have slowed to levels not seen since the summer. For National Native News, I'm Ryan Heinches in Flagstaff. With things returning to more or less normal as COVID-19 recedes around the country, readjusting to the workplace may take some doing for some people. As Tramel Gomes reports, it's okay to ask employers for some reasonable safety precautions and workplace changes. Jane Marks is a licensed mental health counselor in Tallahassee. She says going back is a big shift, and it's perfectly reasonable to ask for things, like perhaps an office by a window. She recommends using the transition as an opportunity for positive change. The idea of going back to a work situation where you may have a little bit more control than you thought you had. You know, people need you. They need you on the ground. They need boots on the ground. Well, you're part of those boots. Marx adds that the pandemic has also shifted the idea of self-care. She says it's no longer a reward, but a requirement in terms of how we could manage our lives with balance. She recommends listening to our bodies, giving ourselves grace, being patient through stressful situations, eating right, exercising, and getting enough sleep. Dr. Nicole Brady with United Healthcare says change can cause people to feel discomfort, so it can help to use a calendar to plan out your day so you can be prepared for what's ahead. Packing a lunch ahead of time, knowing how we're going to get kids to and from activities, but stepping back and doing some advanced planning can really help alleviate some of that return to the office stress. It also can help to find out what your company is doing to keep the office safe and mitigate the spread of COVID. Brady recommends calming apps, which offer mindfulness and meditation exercises, plus access to peer groups and therapy services. This is Tramel Gomes. The commercial Dungeness crab fishery off all of California's coast will be suspended this month because migrating humpback whales have been entangled in fishing gear. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife says fishery zones from the Sonoma-Mendocino County line north to the Oregon state line will close at noon on April 20th. Other zones were to close today. The National Weather Service's warning of weekend fire danger from Sacramento to Redding driven by 
by strong winds, low humidity, and dry fuels. The National Weather Service has issued a so-called red flag warning for the region from tomorrow morning to Sunday evening. It follows several days of heat gripping the state, matching or breaking records in some places. One of the new records, a high of 100 degrees at Long Beach on the south Los Angeles County coast. Broadly, forecasters say the weekend bringing a significant drop in temperatures. Sunny skies predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the upper 60s around the day. 10 degrees warmer still in the inland areas. Sunny and cooler in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the low 80s. And partly sunny tomorrow in the Los Angeles area. Cooler highs in the low 80s. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. The group made serious demands for five institutions to be established on Alcatraz. And why don't we have them yet? A Center for Native American Studies, an American Indian Spiritual Center, and an Indian Center of Ecology that would do scientific research on reversing pollution of water and air. A great Indian training school that would run a restaurant, provide job training, market indigenous arts, and teach the, quote, noble and tragic events of Indian history, including the Trail of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee. And a memorial, a reminder that the island had been established as a prison initially to incarcerate and execute California Indian resistors to U.S. assault on their nations. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1 KPFA.